Well, I'm pleased to introduce you now to uh, Dr. Lester Russell, the Global Chief Medical Officer for Fujitsu. Uh, in addition to being our CMO, Dr. Russell is also a practicing physician uh, back in the UK. So he, he stays connected to patients and problems on a daily basis and works with us uh, across Fujitsu uh, to stay at the forefront of technology innovation in healthcare and how we can work together to solve these uh, increasing challenges in the industry. Um, little known fact about Dr. Russell, uh, he is an accomplished musician plays the drums in a rock band back home, and has uh, been known to cover the Ramones in his free time. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Russell to the stage, please. Thanks, Matt. Thank you. I'm not sure about accomplished musician. Uh, the old joke goes, what do you call someone who follows musicians around a drummer? But um, we're here to talk about brain, the brain, and also the brain project. Uh, and we're going to have a fascinating discussion, I'm, I'm sure of that. Um, I've got two great panelists who are going to join me on stage. Um, please join me now, Myung Chun and Tom Dean. Uh, Myung Chun is VP of Science Programs for the Kavli Foundation. She's had a, a, a very wide span career, starting with biochemistry and then pharmaceutical industry, genomics. She has a PhD in molecular genetics and has worked in molecular biology and cell surface receptors. So someone who's absolutely at the forefront of research and interestingly had a fundamental role in the BRAIN project. The BRAIN project, uh, announced by President Obama earlier on this year, stands for BRAIN Research Through Advancing Innovative Neurotechnologies. And I'm sure we'll hear more about that from, from Mi Young. And then secondly, Tom Dean is a research scientist at Google. He has also had a very wide-ranging career, starting off in mathematics, uh, and he has been a professor of comp computer science and cognitive and linguistic science at Brown University. He has a wide range of research uh, in computational biology and neural modeling, and his latest book is called simply Talking with Computers. So we're going to have a fascinating session. Um, in our discussions in preparing for this session, we, we covered a number of different fields, as I'm sure you'll understand. And, and I wanted to take just a few minutes before I ask Mi Young to, to speak first, uh, to draw out some of the, the themes from those discussions. Um, there were really three. Number one was, was, was the brain IT interface. And, and then secondly, modeling and understanding of the brain with, with ICT. And then the technological stretch, the technological challenge of, of what this project involves in modeling the brain. So firstly, I don't know whether you've caught up with this, but, but this is a, I want to say painting, but, but there's no paint involved. This was created by this lady, Heidi Funzner, who unfortunately suffers with amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, probably better known as motor neurone disease, the, the disease that Stephen Hawking, Professor Hawking has, has got. So she's virtually unable to move any part of her body. And she created this through the interface of scalp electrodes, sort of EEG cap that you've probably seen, like a swimming cap. So she created this by interacting with the computer and created, uh, that's for me just such a a fundamental shift in how we interact with computers and that user interface. And I know that Myung is going to talk a little bit more about that. So, so number one in, in this structure that I'm suggesting to you is, is the, the interface between us as human beings and the computers. The second point that came out from our discussions was, for me, I, I perceive a kind of awkwardness about delving into the brain particularly with IT. 
it, it's, it's almost as if we're, we're happy to look at the structure and function of the kidney and, and ditto the heart and, and other organs. When we're looking at the brain, when we're using the brain to look at the brain, as it were, uh, and I, I'm struck by this that, that was sent to me. It's, it's almost as if we, we, we know that we need to look within, but it's kind of difficult and we're, we're a bit uncomfortable with it. And, and if we're using IT to look at the brain structure, then we quite quickly get to issues like where's the ghost in the machine, uh, where's the spirit, and, and, and then you get into religious issues, which, are very, which is very scary territory. So it, it, there's a kind of uncomfortableness about it. But I, I think we, it's clear that we can use ICT to model the brain and to look into the brain and learn, learn more about its structure. Possibly we can also use what we discover about brain structure and neurons to inform the design of ICT and actually revise our thinking about how IT works. And then finally, the, the, the third theme was the, the scale of the challenge here. There are about a quadrillion synapses, those junctions between neurons, that, that functional gap, if you like, the spark gap, uh, in the brain. So a quadrillion, 10 to the 15, at least in a, in a child, probably somewhat fewer in my brain, uh, but still a hundred trillion probably. Uh, and a quadrillion, an enormous number. If you tried to count them, assuming you could count one per second, it would take you 32 million years. So that's just the number of synapses. And think about the combinations of, of programming and all those complex things that are going on in my head and all of your heads at the moment and modeling that is the most amazing technological stretch. We need for that, I would argue, multidisciplinary input. We need people with mathematics backgrounds, people with molecular biology backgrounds and other people, neurologists, neuroanatomists and so on and so on, electrical engineers and from that multidisciplinary approach we may actually uh, make some progress with this enormously ambitious project. So I just wanted to not preempt what my panelists are going to say but maybe propose that as a structure and, 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 and leave those questions. We, we do want to make this very interactive. So me Young and Tom are going to talk for about 15 minutes each and then we're really going to invite questions from the floor and we want to interact as much as possible. So I will stop there and, and hand over to Mi Young Chun who's going to kick us off with the first session. So please join me in thanking Mi Young. <laughs> Well, my name is Mi Young Chen. I'm uh, Executive Vice President of Science Programs at the Kavali Foundation. It's a foundation which actually supports our basic research in uh, four fields, theoretical physics, astrophysics, nanoscience, and, uh, and neuroscience. I, th I think that I would like to uh, uh, agree with Lester mentioning that we really like to believe that uh, next frontier this scientific discovery will come from uh, intersecting uh, between a variety of different scientific fields. And with that in mind, uh, the foundation actually uh, supports a variety of different fields of science. I'm charged to actually talk a little bit about the genesis of uh, this brain initiative. So I'll begin with our next slide. Where um, in developing this uh, project, I must uh, have been involved in over a thousand teleconferences and maybe a hundred meetings and so on between September 2011 and April uh, 2013 when President announced this initiative. Of those uh, meetings, uh, I think that uh, 12 events were the key uh, and those events can be um, I think uh, categorized in, in three different ways. One of which is the first one, uh, that uh, which were, I think, in my mind, most important ones to discuss uh, science of it all. Why do we need such uh, an initiative uh, that will take minimum decade, if not longer? And uh, these are the meetings that we discussed the goals of the uh, project, uh, what are the technological challenges, and what are opportunities, and what could be the byproduct that could be really uh, wonderful for the uh, society. 
and uh, the second set of the meetings. Oh, I see. I'm sorry. Great. Are what I call inter-agency uh, brainstorming sessions. Uh, these are the meetings that uh, we gathered among federal funding agencies as well as um, private sectors uh, and try to make this project as uh, grand challenges of 21st century that White House has initiated in 2012. Um, and those uh, sets of meetings then led to uh, President Obama mentioning this project during his State of the Union uh, address in February, and then in turn uh, announcing this uh, initiative as a national initiative in, in, in April. I wanted to go over some of the details of those uh, events. Uh, in our minds, it all began in uh, September 2011 um, when uh, I put together a workshop together with uh, Gatsby Charitable Foundation and Allen Institute for Brain Sciences. Uh, the workshop title called Opportunities at the Interface of Neuroscience and Nanoscience. The foundation has a meeting site uh, called Cavalry Royal Society. It's a Chitsley Hall, a uh, beautiful country estate, 80 acre, uh, uh, country home in uh, off Buckinghamshire and actually Leicester, you should have a meetings there. It's, uh, <laughs> it has about 50 bedrooms and then uh, for a conference setting that uh, they can host about 200 people. It's in that meeting uh, when uh, neuroscientists and nanoscientists met for almost uh, two days, nothing was happening. They were talking offsetting, you know, their languages were different, they, their goals of scientific matters were different. I mean, it was actually not going very well. Until the very last two hours, we had what's called blue sky session. And it's in that uh, session that a lot of nanoscientists were asking neuroscientists what are your holy grail ideas. And that's when neuroscientists specify that, in effect, our holy grail idea is that we don't understand how brain works to the rate that we don't have a single general theory as to how brain works. Uh, the reason is because uh, brain, of course, as Lester mentioned, is a completely very complex uh, place. And we, the fact is that we know how to actually look at the brain's activity at a single cell level. Uh, and um, up to maybe perhaps a couple hundred or so. Um, and that's been done really well, and that took quite a long time, I think about 60 years or so, for scientists to work really hard to go from measuring one single cell up to about 200 cells or so. But you heard from Lester that the brain has uh, more than uh, about 100 billion neuronal cells, and each neuronal cells are uh, having interaction with minimum thousand other neurons. So if we understand how single cells and their activity, it would be as though I think Rafa used that puts uh, uh, in a really uh, understandable uh, metaphor such that suppose you're watching a movie in this large scale screen but then you're trying to understand the movie by watching one pixel out of this whole screen. How could you possibly understand how the whole movie is about? And it's in certain ways what we're doing right now because of the lack of technology advancement that we're not being able to measure the activities of a much larger scale uh, and therefore we don't understand how brain works. So uh, from that meeting then, uh, we then end up uh, writing what's called in you know, a concept paper to the White House Office of Science, uh, Technology and Policy. And uh, we had a great reception from the White House. They thought indeed this is the holy grail problem that we are lacking. And, uh, from there, then, we ended up having many more meetings, uh, often hosted by Office of Science and Technology Policy, and engaging many different kinds of funding agencies, as I mentioned, between public, uh, NIH, NSF, DARPA, and a private, uh, not only the Kavli Foundation. By the time uh, when uh, October 2012 came about, we were now a group of more than 10 different uh, private funding agencies, including were Allen Institute, uh, 
Howard Hughes Medical Institute, Simons Foundation, CAC Foundation, and including also uh, foundations in Europe, uh, Wellcome Trust, uh, as well as Gatsby Foundation. These uh, meetings then uh, led us to uh, write up what we call sort of manifesto, the proposal, the roadmap of uh, this initiative, which was published in Neuron and then uh, later in Science. These were the kinds of documents that uh, among those of us who were involved in, uh, there were about 150 scientists who were involved in these uh, different workshops. Uh, and it was our opinion, uh, hoping that it will stimulate scientific community and industry, so then uh, it can be a national initiative. And to our surprise, a uh, couple of things I wanted to mention. Among us, uh, we were of course very concerned about the basic science element of what this project can do. But we want to emphasize that that will have absolutely important practical implication. And I just wanted to give you a few examples of that. So in the case of um, deep brain stimulation, which is uh, uh, more than 150,000 patients actually have this uh, treatment. And if you can play the movie, here's just an example of what you can see. Um, this patient has a very dif difficult time with movement. And as you can see on the right side, that uh, after this deep brain stimulation treatment, he has uh, really confidence in how he can move his body gesture. And uh, next slide. Oh. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> and uh, deep brain simulation is a rather very simple uh, process. It has uh, three elements into um, the treatment. Uh, neurostimulator is almost like pacemaker-like uh, device, which has a battery, and then it has a circuitry, uh, so that so then it can actually stimulate electricity through the extension and it goes to the head in uh, deep brain stimulation lead. The bottom of that lead uh, is the electrodes that will now then stimulate uh, the patient's brain. The brain initiative will help uh, patients like these situations and uh, these are not only being treated for, uh, as you saw from perhaps Parkinson's patients, but also it's, it's very, uh, it has a great efficacy in uh, behavioral uh, situations such as depression and there are now clinical trials on Alzheimer's patients as well. Uh, so the brain initiative for understanding more about how precisely our brain actually acts action is, then it will help uh, more for these kinds of treatments. Uh, I mentioned that because there are indeed a variety of different kinds of side effects for this uh, treatment. On one hand, uh, the, the patient that we saw before is having difficult time with tr uh, tremming, uh, but then uh, that helped uh, controlling that. But such patient can have a variety of different side effects such as other behavioral issues. Another big issue about treatment like this one is that these are very invasive uh, procedures such that uh, you do have to undergo tremendous uh, surgical procedures, uh, both in the head as well as, uh, as you see with her. Uh, this, the size of the neurostimulator is something that through brain initiative, uh, in, uh, perhaps we can make it much smaller. Other medical implications that we can imagine it comes from this movie, You Can Begin, where uh, this patient uh, has a stroke, multiple stroke, and she has been actually paralyzed for the past 15 years. And here, by uh, stimulating merely uh, 96 neurons in her head, she can now then actually, by just thinking, move the robotic arm here and drink her morning coffee on her own just by thinking. And uh, as you can see that she executes this activity very readily and she can do it every day. And um, you may see in a few seconds uh, that she'll be very happy to do such a, see how happy she is? It's wonderful. Um, the issue here is that as you see from top of her, her head, she has to now then uh, have a uh, large instrument uh, that's sticking out of her head. And behind that line, which we don't see, is the stack of computer that's the side of, size of this podium. 
and so I think that, uh, again, Brain Initiative can help uh, making this uh, situation So this is what we imagine it can happen, where she can perhaps stay, stay in her own kitchen. And uh, instead of using the robotic arm, it would be great if she could actually use her own arm. And uh, instead of having the device coming out of her head, it could be in, you know, embedded under skin of her head. And then her computer now is sized from there to it can be the, just the size of the uh, perhaps iPhone. The next slide. Oh. And uh, other uh, things are, um, I think that it has been mentioned several times uh, through today and then even last year, that we can use our brain as a remote control in many different ways. Uh, one on the left is uh, someone who's having EEG cap and then now simulating how to learn to uh, fly. And then on the right is uh, the Samsung uh, just published paper in collaboration with University of Dallas study where you can just Google everything just by looking at it and thinking about uh, uh, how to do it. And uh, hopefully that, uh, that we can improve our uh, look of those EEG caps as seen on the bottom and, and I think that that's coming up very, very fast. With these uh, things in, in our mind, uh, uh, we were working really hard to make this initiative and I have to say that throughout all this uh, about 18 months process by this time in February uh, 2013, uh, to me the best surprise came when I was watching State of the Union address and you know White House doesn't tell you that you know they're gonna actually talk about your project and so while I was California about 8 o'clock. By 8.10, President uh, mentioned uh, today our scientists are mapping the human brain to unlock uh, the answers to Alzheimer's and I just stood up uh, thinking, did he just mention the project that I've been working for for so long? And uh, sure enough that in five minutes I had an email from White House mentioning, congratulations Mi Young, you just made the State of the Union address. So I was very happy about that. And um, we had a great support from NIH, in particular from uh, the director Francis Collins, and he tweeted that night mentioning that President mentioned the brain activity map. It was the brain initiative used to be called brain activity map. So with these, uh, uh, President actually officially announced this uh, project called Brain Initiative on April 2nd. And that's the story of the genesis of Brain Initiative. Thank you very much, Mio. Thank you. <laughs> and let's press straight on, handing the mantle to Tom Dean. Please join me in welcoming Tom. So, um, graphics artists have uh, become pretty skilled at rendering pretty pictures of brain-like images. Um, but you really shouldn't be misled uh, by the pretty pictures. Our current understanding uh, is more in keeping uh, with this uh, ticker tape. Oops. Are you wording it? Okay. Uh, um, our current understanding uh, is more in keeping with this tinker toy model uh, of a neural circuit and the level of conceptualization which is analogous to the Rutherford model of the atom uh, which we had in the beginning of the 20th century. Uh, that's not to say we don't know a lot about individual neurons. Um, we actually do. Um, but we don't know a lot about how they behave together uh, in neural circuits consisting of more than a few neurons. The brain initiative uh, just described by Dr. Chun uh, and the related initiative uh, funded by the European Union have uh, focused attention on the brain and on developing a new generation of scientific instruments to accelerate research. 
These instruments uh, will be used to record static or structural information uh, and dynamic or behavioral information at unprecedented spatial and temporal resolution and report out that information um, in a form suitable for computational analysis. We distinguish between recording, um, uh, taking measurements of individual cells uh, and the extracellular matrix and reporting, uh, which corresponds to transcoding, packaging, and transmitting the resulting information for subsequent analysis. Since these operations represent very different challenges as we scale the relevant technologies uh, to support simultaneously tracking uh, the many neurons that comprise uh, the neural circuits uh, that scientists are interested in looking at. In this brief introduction, um, we'll take a look at a few of the relevant technologies uh, with the purpose of anticipating their development over the span of the next 10 years uh, and categorizing their impact in terms of short term, uh, one to two years, medium term, two to five, uh, and longer term, five to 10 years out deliverables. And I'm going to de deviate from a strictly chronological treatment uh, for reasons that will soon become apparent. We'll start with some technologies uh, that are likely to have an impact uh, over the next two years. The most powerful uh, recording and reporting technologies currently available all use some form of imaging in which some portion of the acoustic or the electromagnetic spectrum uh, is used to illuminate a target tissue uh, and then the resulting response, um, attenuated as it's likely to be by absorption, reflection, uh, and scattering, is analyzed to extract the useful information about the structure, such as the connections between axons and dendrites uh, and function, uh, for example, action potentials. Uh, here, uh, we see some results from Sebastian Sung's uh, lab at MIT showing the 3D reconstruction of cell bodies uh, from scanning electron micrographs. These relatively mature imaging technologies largely finesse the problems relating to powering reporting devices uh, and carrying out the computations required for signal processing, compression, transmission, um, and um, uh, things that are required uh, for uh, uh, the subsequent analysis. Example technologies include magnetic resonance imaging, um, the focused ultrasound, uh, what's called photoacoustic imaging, two photon calcium imaging, immunofluorescence for genomics, and array tomography uh, for proteomics. Um, uh, illustrated here in a 3D reconstruction uh, of a dendrite uh, showing the presence of color coded proteins. Um, this is from uh, Stephen Smith's lab at, uh, at Stanford. Incremental improvements in these technologies are likely to continue, uh, enabled by advances in material science and funded uh, by applications in medicine. And some of the latest results, uh, features of interest are enhanced by using what are called contrast agents that correspond to various stains that are differentially absorbed by cellular structure uh, and serve to alter the, the spectral characteristics of the tissue. Tissue samples can be prepared in such a way that structures that would normally absorb or scatter light, such as the bilipid layers that comprise cell membranes, um, are rendered transparent. Dyes can be integrated into a living text, uh, tissue uh, and used as indicators for the presence of molecules of interest, like calcium, uh, to measure the changes in membrane potential. Of course, adding these contrast agents uh, changes the optical properties uh, of the tissue uh, and it, thereby limiting uh, penetration depth. However, we can count on these mature technologies uh, to continue to improve incrementally. They are, however, uh, fundamentally limited by light scattering uh, and the loss in penetration depth this causes. On the left side of this slide, uh, we see a frame of a movie uh, showing um, real-time calcium imaging of a live uh, naturally transparent embryonic zebrafish uh, from research conducted at Janelia Farms um, campus of the Howard Hughes uh, Medical Institute. On the right, uh, we see some results from Carl Deseros' lab at Stanford showing the 3D volume of a mouse brain imaged using their new clarity tissue preparation method that, rep rep that uh, renders a, a clarity prepared tissue, tran uh, tissue uh, transparent. And this overcomes the limitations of existing technologies, but really only for non-living tissue. So now let's jump ahead five to 10 years, and, and, and we'll backtrack in a minute to look at what's in the nearer term. 
One approach to achieving significantly improved spatial and temporal resolution is to enlist bioengineers and nanotechnologists to develop nanoscale recording and reporting devices that can be co-located with the targets of interest in the neural tissue. There are a number of challenges to achieving this. We're already using CMOS technology to fabricate 3D probes for electrophysiology and optogenetics, such as those shown here, those shown here uh, from Ed Boyden's lab at MIT. But Ed's probes are, uh, are tethered to uh, fiber optically uh, so that all the signal processing analysis uh, can be performed outside the brain where power and size uh, are less of an issue. We would like to be able to, to uh, build nanoscale equivalent of RFID chips that could be chronically implanted uh, in human brains to provide the basis for powerful new brain-computer interfaces uh, and new types of neural prosthetics. Moore's law and related predictions of progress in miniaturizing computational hardware indicate uh, that in the next five years or so, uh, we'll be able to manufacture chips of roughly the same size as a single cell, less than 10 nanometers, uh, with something on the order of 10,000 transistors. Our rough calculations indicate that uh, we would also have to reduce the power requirements to about uh, 5, 10 uh, nanowatts uh, uh, to have some chance of powering the devices in such a way that we can both dissipate the heat um, and not cause cellular damage. We'd also have to deal with the toxicity of current uh, semiconductor technology, but perhaps the biggest challenge involves solving the related uh, reporting problem, getting the information out of the brain. The obvious approaches to utilizing existing RF and optical communication technologies don't really scale to billions of nanoscale reporters. And so in terms of the promise of, nan of, of nanotechnology, it seems we're awaiting some, some fundamental breakthroughs uh, in nanoscale communication networks in order to achieve some of the more ambitious goals um, of the BRAIN project. We skipped over the two to five year um, medium term prospects uh, for new technology not because uh, we, we think uh, nothing promising is likely to surface during that time, but rather to underscore the belief um, that despite high expectations, nanotechnology may not be able to deliver uh, on its promise uh, in the next five years. There are, however, some, some very interesting technologies that may emerge from the field of synthetic biology um, in the next five years. A single neuron is a complex composite of, of millions of special purpose nanoscale machines. More generally, uh, the great diversity of organisms found in nature offers an incredible array of, of, of molecules that are employed within cells for computing, sensing, signaling. And these, and these biomolecular devices um, are several orders of magnitude more efficient uh, than current CMOS uh, uh, devices. Our efforts so far to harness these biological machines in order to perform um, uh, logic and arithmetic um, have been hampered by the fact uh, that biological circuits coerced into implementing such computations uh, are orders of magnitude slower than CMOS. However, for those computations uh, required for survival, uh, natural selection has stumbled on some highly efficient solutions. Bioengineers are compiling libraries of biomolecules found in nature that perform such specialized computations. And it's often said that if you need a specific functional component for manip manipulating uh, uh, molecular uh, information, then you just have to find the organism in nature uh, that requires that function uh, and then repurpose it for your purposes. This kind of biomolecular recycling uh, may be our most uh, expedient uh, strategy for getting to the next level uh, in two to five years. Examples currently under develop include using uh, retroviruses such as tame variants of the rabies and HIV virus uh, to trace circuits uh, and infer connectomic uh, structure of the brain. Uh, in terms of, of, of this, this task of, of inferring the, uh, the connectome, which is normally done um, using uh, scanning electron microscopy, um, the basic idea is pretty simple. Have every cell um, uh, generate a random DNA sequence uh, to, serve, to, to serve as a unique barcode. Next, have each your neuron propagate its barcode to each of its synaptically adjacent neighbors. Then have each, number, uh, each of the neurons create pairs of, of barcodes 
uh, consisting of its own unique barcode um, and one of the unique uh, one of the the barcodes that it's gotten from its neighbors. Uh, finally, you sacrifice the animal, uh, chemically stabilize uh, its brain tissue, slice the pickled brain uh, into micron-sized uh, little cubes, and then sequence uh, the DNA uh, in order to uh, recover the connectomic information. The biology is somewhat more complicated, as you might imagine, um, but our initial proof of concept uh, demonstration uh, appears to be doable uh, in the next three years. Using computer animation based on the latest research, we are now able to see how DNA is actually copied in living cells. Thank you. Uh, a more speculative approach uh, proposes uh, using DNA polymerase, um, the enzyme responsible for DNA replication, to record electrical potential. This is an animation showing DNA polymerase replicating a double-stranded molecule of DNA. Some genetic variants uh, of polymerase can synthesize base pairs at a rate of about 1,000 uh, base pairs or nucleotides per second. Um, the proposed method for recording electrical potential depends on polymerase making errors uh, in copying. The probability of po uh, that polymerase will make a mistake and incorporate the wrong nucleotide uh, into the replicated strand is dependent on the concentration of calcium. And since the propagation of action potentials results in a change uh, in the local concentration of calcium in the synaptic terminals, uh, you can use the, the misincorporation rate um, to encode uh, information about the spikes uh, in polymerase replicated strands of DNA, uh, a reference template that's already known in advance. Um, it's, it's quite ingenious, um, and several labs uh, are working on this at the time, at the current time. And while it probably won't end up uh, in, a, in, a, in a useful practical t uh, technology uh, exactly uh, as I've described it here, um, some variant of it is likely to be uh, uh, available probably within the next five years. There are literally uh, hundreds of different technology uh, that we've been considering uh, for possible solutions to brain recording and reporting. Um, if you're interested in learning more about this, um, you can uh, Google my class at Stanford. Uh, just do CS379C, that's the uh, catalog number for the course at Stanford, uh, and you'll find a portal to the, to the page. My students and I um, are developing a report uh, that describes um, a, uh, uh, a few dozen of, of these most promising technologies, uh, and we'll be uh, uh, publishing that in the near term. Thanks. Thank you, Tom. Thank you. Thanks very much, Tom and Mee Young. It's fascinating. So, questions. Any questions from the audience, first of all? Yes, please. Uh, where's the lady? Yeah. There you go. Thank you. Richard Adler from Institute for the Future. Um, I remember when the announcement was made of the uh, launch of this initiative, and there was some controversy about whether this made sense uh, at all. And where, whereas um, you know, sequencing the human genome had a pretty clear goal, and it's kind of a big project, but it was linear in a sense. Uh, this seems sort of um, incredibly open-ended, almost uh, dizzyingly so. And I'm wondering how you respond to that criticism, and and can you describe what you know a, a, an end state, a successful end state, might be? And uh, in many different ways, in those workshops that we had, we had discussed that specific point many times, uh, and ended up actually not coming up with specific number. That is to say, should we say, there were some of the uh, scientists who were saying we should have a million neuron march as a subtitle for the initiative because if we can measure a million neurons, I mean, how wonderful could that be? And um, so, but then a lot of uh, true uh, scientific questions came in hand, and that is, we don't really know how many neurons activity should we measure for us to actually understand how brain works. For all we know, it could be smaller numbers or much larger numbers. Not, 
that's how primitive understanding we have for how brain works. If we already had any estimate that if we measure 10,000 neurons activities in multiple places in brain, perhaps we will already understand much deeper in how brain works, we would have chosen that number. If we knew that it would take more than a million, we would have chosen that number too. But the fact is, we don't. And so we didn't want to put something, some numbers and then miss out on truly understanding the brain function through this initiative. So that was one reason. So it was a very scientific reason. The other reason was among the scientists who discussed this uh, project also had huge uh, segregation. One group who had been in neuroscience for I think many years, I mean, as I mentioned to you, that it took them 60 years to go from measuring single cell activity to up to maybe 200. I mean, it's, you know, Moore's law is just out the door here. You know, they just can't match that. It took, I think, uh, about three years, every three years to measuring more, you know, I don't know, 50 new ones or something like that. So those group of scientists who had been at it at this field for many years said, there's no way we will be able to measure a million anytime soon. Even if we have this initiative for 15 years, we will not get there. There were the other side of scientists who were coming, a lot coming from you know, physicists and engineers and so on. You don't know that. You haven't captured imaginations of all the engineers out there. The national initiative will capture the imaginations of scientists physicists, chemists, you know, other engineers who have never thought about doing this project before might come in and solve this problem much faster than neuroscientists had been working on for the past six years. I mean, another way to look at it is in the case of Genome Project, uh, first phase when they were using the same technology from PE for maybe certain years, of course they were actually sequencing much faster than they anticipated before but it was still in a certain slope. But soon as they opened technology to all scientists, now then they could sequence so much faster and so much cheaper. So idea for this initiative is not to park ourselves in specific number due to the complexity and unknown nature of the brain function. And this sounds bad to public when they hear the initiative, but it is the sounding decision, really. Uh, it's the right decision. That we should focus more on using this initiative, inspire more young scientists, the scientists in engineering sector and physical scientist sector who have never worked on this project to come in and solve this problem faster. That's the goal, not about meeting million neurons activity, and then let's see what we can do. So that's the reason. Thank you. Brad over there has got a question. How would, you, how would you contrast your work with Henry Markram's, and do you intend to actually build emulations of these networks that can match scene behavior in biological systems? Could you repeat your question? So how do you contrast your approach with Henry Markram's, and do you plan to actually build emulations of neural systems that match biological performance? Actually, when we were initiating this project, we were not conscientious of a European initiative, which is now called Human uh, Brain Project. Uh, but now that it is here in our side and it is there in their side, serendipitously turned out to be, I think, great marriage, in a sense that they are doing the simulation, but they need good data set for their simulations to be better or perfect. In our case, I'm sorry, we're doing the actual measurements. So, but we also need some modeling for us to measure more and it would be more meaningful. So it's turning out to be actually great marriage. And in effect, uh, there will be a variety of different uh, sessions that's upcoming. For example, a Society for Neuroscience meeting will have a session uh, having the Human Brain Project folks coming. And then uh, our Brain Initiative folks will talk together and have panels and so on. So there are a lot of planned collaborations between two, two initiatives. 
And, and Henry may be one of two co-directors and, and maybe he has some handle on the purse strings, um, but there are over 200 other scientists that are involved in it, um, and many of them aren't really working on simulations. Um, and relative to what uh, Dr. Chun just mentioned, um, Henry believes that, that stochastic models of the structure and uh, uh, connectomics of, of the brain um, will suffice for, for building good sim simulations. And many scientists don't believe that's the case. Um, and the kind of uh, devices, scientific instruments that uh, the Brain Project is going to be developing will be able to provide the data. Uh, so there's a lot of uh, complementary uh, science that's uh, likely to happen. Thank you. We've got a question over here. Thank you very much. Hi, Mark Stublick, Proteus. Um, as I recall from the human genome era uh, and those early days, that they began with smaller uh, genomes. I think it was Drosophilia that was first um, uh, re reduced. And I'm wondering if there's a similar process for the brain where we start with, say, insects or worms or some other smaller life form and um, get all of those connections first and learn from those before you move on. So this is another topic that we discussed uh, quite many times. And uh, there were, again, different schools of thoughts <laughs> on this. <laughs> Sometimes scientists did uh, think that, for example, worms have only 302 neurons. And so why don't we actually do the whole activity measurement on it and then better understand from there? So then we can move on to different levels. Uh, but then already from, uh, I think Tom just showed a uh, uh, data set from Genelia Farm, uh, I think last month, they were able to measure the whole uh, zebrafish larva brain. Uh, they have about 100,000 neuron, 100, neurons, but they, they were able to observe 80,000 neuron activity all at once. And so uh, I think things are moving forward much faster in that perspective, so that's a good news. But different way, to, and for that reason, the, the idea for the moment is not to go step by step, but actually do more parallel activities for different reasons. I mean, I've shown you, the, I think Professor John Donahue's study with this stroke patient uh, who was able to drink her own coffee by herself in 15 years is a great example. There, she actually was having the chip of 96 uh, neuronal cell stimulation made her able to do what she did. In many different ways, there's a lot of opportunities that we can help humans' lives very fast. So why should we wait that opportunity after we understand other smaller organisms? That didn't make sense. So we're going to try to do more parallel activities. So then I guess another question is, is it more uh, the project to uh, the neural in interface to electronics, or is it understanding the, the operation and how the brain works? Which, which do you think, are they both equally um, supported or valid? So in this case, uh, what is really great about this project, and I think the president mentioned to me that I made a miracle puzzle because he's trying to get two parties to work together, which is very hard, but I was able to put together like 10 groups to work together. And that's the beauty of this initiative. Suppose NIH, NSF, and DARPA started to fund this project. They'll go at it in a very different way. For example, DARPA might be the one who will go after something that will take much longer to, um, to see the outcome. For example, they'll be going after looking for non-invasive uh, uh, procedure uh, for you know, veterans who come back for prosthetics or for, I think that, uh, uh, some of the emotional uh, damage that they may have. So they may take on project that's quite different from let's say what NIH would. And same for NSF, they might be going after very fundamental uh, nature of the questions. And so that's what's gonna be great within public funding. But for private sectors, again, are all very different. Um, what HHMI wants differ from Allen, Salk, and so on. So as we add more numbers of partners, each partner will have different goals, and therefore we will complement our activities together. I think the name of the game here that's gonna be really hard is how are they going to share the data? So then we can help each other. That has not been common sense in the past. But Human Genome Project, they did it, and we think we can do it again. 
And as far as the um, uh, you know precedents for this, the Allen Institute um, has developed uh, the Mouse Brain Atlas, uh, which already provides connectomic uh, and proteomic uh, maps of the mouse brain, and um, the the numbers of, of different uh, disciplines, subdisciplines of neuroscience that are interested in looking at the brain from completely different perspectives. Um, there are already examples in the case of the Allen Institute of joining that information to making it possible to do correlations across those different types of maps to understand basic um, uh, disease uh, pathways uh, and uh, um, uh, as well as normal functioning. Uh, and we're likely to see even more of that because the initiative has as its foundation um, the combination of those kinds of data uh, to provide that kind of uh, uh, multi-dimensional perspective. Question just at the back there, I think. Some... Yeah, Dave. Oh, yeah, Dave Marvick, Purdue 2 Labs. So the connectome seems to me just a pattern of connections but not the strength of the connections. Is there any attempt or thoughts about how you model that? Because without that, you don't really have so much. Yeah. Um, so uh, the, the technology that I described uh, based upon um, a, a being able to, uh, um, to, to sequence the, the various uh, aspects of connections, that doesn't capture that. Um, however, uh, the, the kind of work that's using scanning electron mic microscopy, it does at least in the sense that, that they, A, are, are able to, to define exactly the size uh, or, or um, gap uh, in the synaptic connections, um, and then B, identify the corresponding neurotransmitters that are effective uh, at those gaps. And the combination of those two pieces of information, uh, you can start to get a better uh, estimate of what the actual connection strengths are. So yes, the connectome ultimately is supposed to characterize both of those. And again, this idea that somehow you are able to, to look not just at you know, the, the structural properties of the, of, the, of the brain, but also its genomic and proteomic ones uh, provide a, a lens uh, that you can extract or infer additional pieces of information of the sort you're interested in. One more related question. Um, that that uh, DNA transcription error, DNA replication error uh, for tracking activity is incredibly cool. I was just wondering if there's any mechanism to synchronize the DNA transcripts across the different cells, because if not, then um, again, you have much less than you would if they were, were synchronized. That's an excellent question. Uh, and um, it's, so, so what, the, the kind of bio uh, biomolecular engineering that's going on um, in developing these things is getting down to trying to figure out how we do lots of things uh, with computers. So. Doing things asynchrony, we're, uh, asynchronously, we're getting better at doing that because our networks are all based upon asynchronous uh, computers. Uh, and so some of the techniques from that um, for doing checkpointing, um, for uh, sending uh, diffuse signals uh, through the brain, uh, all of which can then synchronize a clock to get the initial start um, of, the, of the transcriptions, all those kinds of techniques are being pulled out. Um, and, and every one of them um, is, is a fundamental problem. So the, the earliest instance of this, of this kind of technology, you'll, you'll take a, a tissue um, uh, in, in vitro, you'll, you will um, uh, use a virus to, to assign the, the nanoscale devices, uh, and then you'll probably give some electrical signal to the entire thing uh, in order to start the transcriptions. But, but the general problem is really tricky um, and uh, uh, a wonderful sort of nut to try to crack. Thank you. Question over on the on my right there. Thank you. You all have been talking about the need for multidisciplinary um, work in this area, and then you brought up the problem of how people share results. <clears throat> so I'd like to ask you about how you think we should address the publication system. I have a friend who's a biophysicist, did some interesting work on calcium transport across synapses. He wrote a paper in which he cited Shannon Weaver. Uh, the publication is a well-known and well-respected publication in his field. They, 
composed primarily of biologists, chemists, and biophysicists. They said, well, we've never read Shannon Weaver. You, you have to take those citations out of the paper or we won't publish it. He said, how can you understand communications across a synapse if you don't understand communications theory? You should read the papers. The result is that his paper has never been published. So how, how, do you, how, how do we address, so if we get these people working together, how are they going to get the results out if the normal publication system can't deal with it? The, the, new, the new generation of, of what are called systems uh, neuroscientists and systems biologists, um, they are fundamentally uh, groups of, of, of scientists that include biologists, biophysicists, physicists, computer scientists, um, all intermingling. Uh, and if you start looking at the literature, and in particular the references, the citations at the end of those articles, they also span all those disciplines. So the neat thing is, is that, that the problems are so hard uh, and they span so many complicated uh, uh, um, areas of specialty uh, that all these people are forced to start working together um, and they're finding out um, uh, the literature and, and how to navigate uh, in that, ac that literature uh, as a matter of course. And I think that the problem being solved essentially uh, by the difficulty of the problems we're facing. I mean, one of the uh, criteria to make uh, this initiative as part of the grand challenges of 21st century was uh, to justify why now? Uh, why not 10 years later? Why wasn't it done 10 years before? And I think that I'm uh, agreeing to Tom in a sense that uh, the stage of science where it is today is such that uh, the interdisciplinary research has been emphasized enough uh, and that many younger scientists had been uh, actually already performing experiments mm -hmm. only in that way. I mean, you go to colleges and so on nowadays and look at many of the graduate students, you go to either biology lab or even physics lab and so on, there's a lot of students whose project is already very multidisciplinary. So we hope that in the future it will be an easier <coughs> task. Uh, it has not been in the past, but we think that now it's going to be feasible. But you're actually right though, still it is an issue. We have to go over this hardship. Um, because of the tenure situation and, and so many different uh, hurdles that uh, our younger f faculty members are facing. Yeah. I think Max Planck uh, was the one who said that, that science progresses uh, one funeral at a time. Ouch. <laughs> <laughs> and on that note of um, working happily together in harmony, I'm afraid I've got the difficult job of drawing this to a close. We could go on for, for, for ages. That's truly been fascinating and certainly exceeded my expectations. So please join me in thanking Tom and Leon. Thank you very much.